Have you ever prayed to God and God answered your prayer in a way that didn't make a lot of sense to you? I think that's a fairly common occurrence. One of the reasons why one of the most reoccurring thoughts in many Christians' minds is not having a whole lot of faith in the power of prayer, wondering what good does it do. And certainly in our culture, from an outside perspective, we hear that often. Thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, what good does that do? And yet sometimes when I read Christian writers who have a prayer life that I envy, they seem convinced that not only is prayer powerful, but that it does probably more than anything else we do. We just can't really see it or make sense of it. Maybe you've prayed for healing for yourself or someone else, and instead the healing doesn't occur. The suffering continues, the burden stays something that God decides we need to bear. Or maybe the healing is just delayed for far longer than you'd like. Or maybe you've prayed for success. If you're in school as a student, maybe you were praying for success on a test and you didn't succeed, at least according to what you were hoping. Or maybe you even failed. But God is at work even in those answers the Bible tells us. Or maybe your success came in another area of your life where you weren't even looking for it. Well, maybe you've prayed a prayer for recovery from illness or a serious disease, and instead the result is death. I've noticed that uh, one of the things that scares people when I ask them to pray out loud, beyond just praying out loud, because it's not as common a practice as it should be, is especially when they have to pray for something really serious, something that part of them knows, I may pray for this, and it's not going to work out the way that I want it to. And so they stumble over the words and they don't know exactly what to say because a part of them knows that the answer may not be what they want to hear or what the person who they've been asked to pray for wants to hear. So how do we deal with, as Christians, the reality that sometimes our prayers, we believe, are always answered, but often not in the way that we would like or in some cases, the opposite of what we specifically ask for. Well, our Old Testament reading and our Gospel reading today provide some insight in how God deals with prayers, especially the sort of prayers that have answers that don't make a lot of sense to us. We begin in Numbers 21 were the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness. And what do they do? If you had to take a guess, the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, if they are doing anything, they're complaining. They're complaining against God and against Moses. And their complaint doesn't really make a lot of sense. I'll read it for you again. This is his verse, verses five, this is verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So there's, there's no food, but this food is worthless. So they're clearly getting food. They just don't like the food. And despite God's continual provision for them up to this point, it doesn't taste good enough, so we're going to complain And then what does God do? He punishes them for their sin against Him. They slandered God. They accused Him of leading them out of Egypt to die and that He's not a very good provider. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and many were bit and many died. And as is the case still today, when we encounter suffering and despair, what do we do? We pray. Right? That's the way it works. Often when things are going well, the first thing we forget to do is pray. Prayer of thanksgiving or prayers for the blessings of other people. But as soon as trouble strikes, we pray. And we should. We should. So they pray. And listen to what they pray. They say to Moses, we've sinned 
For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that He takes away the serpents from us. So they ask Moses, because they know Moses speaks with God, pray on our behalf that God would take away the serpents. Does God answer their prayer? He does, but not in the way that they want. He does not remove the serpents. That's nowhere in here. Instead, he instructs Moses to do this. Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. How weird is that? Why would he do that? It seems like the people have the right idea, right? We, we sinned against God, consequence was given, remove the consequence, please, we're sorry. And instead, God doesn't remove their suffering, but He does provide something that overcomes their suffering, a healing for those who look at this raised serpent. Well, now we're going to fast forward to our gospel reading in John chapter 3. And Nicodemus has come to visit Jesus in the night, and he's learning all kinds of things he didn't know before. And our gospel reading starts with a connection to this account in Numbers 21. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Now, by show of hands, before you were a Christian, did you pray for God to send His Son to die on a cross to save you from your sins? Oh. Did you forget? Or did you not even think of such a solution? Or, to go even deeper, the Scriptures tell us that we didn't even know what the real problem was. It's easy to read Numbers 21 and think those silly Israelites complaining again. We're the Israelites. We do the same thing. We don't even know the real situation for which we ought to pray, the real source of our suffering, nor the real solution. But Paul gives us an insight into the nature of our God in his epistle reading today, the measureless grace that he shows us. And Jesus echoes it in the verse that is called the gospel in a nutshell, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Your salvation is not your own doing, Paul tells us, but it is a work of God and a gift of God And I can't see any way that that's made more apparent by the fact that we don't even know the right question to ask, the right prayer to pray. Because like the Israelites, you and I, what do we often pray for? God, take away my suffering. Whatever it is. Maybe it's an illness that you have or a loved one has. Maybe it's failure at your job or that you don't have enough money to make ends meet and you're worried about those things and you want God to just come in and fix the source of your suffering. Now, sometimes He does, but all of you also know sometimes He doesn't. Sometimes the person you love who has cancer or is in a major car accident doesn't recover. Sometimes they die. Sometimes when you pray that God would deliver you from the suffering of worrying about whether or not you're going to have enough to make ends meet, still it torments you. And it can seem for many of us that often that God isn't actually listening, that He isn't answering my prayer. And I can imagine some of the Israelites who were bit after Moses prayed on their behalf to God felt the same way. Said, well, it's great that you put the serpent up here and I can look at it and live, but uh, I'm still getting bit. What gives? Isn't that true for us? And that's really one of the weird aspects of Lent for Christians that people outside our community don't really understand. That we can be mindful of the reality of sin in ourselves and in the world, and not despair. Even though there are times where we pray that God would remove some of these sufferings from our life, and His answer is no. 
Why is that the case? Well, just like for the Israelites in the Old Testament, God doesn't remove our suffering. Sometimes the suffering is a natural consequence of our own sin, like complaining against God and accusing Him of leading you out in the wilderness to die. And other times, it's just the manifestation of sin in our fallen creation. But our God answers in His immeasurable grace the deeper need and the real prayer that we should be praying, just like He did for His people in the wilderness long ago. You see, He knows the real cause of your suffering isn't cancer, it isn't money troubles, it isn't relational strife. These are all symptoms of a deeper problem, a problem that you and I aren't even aware of until we are given faith. So not only do we not know it's there, we don't ask for it, and yet God in His immeasurable mercy answers that prayer anyways and sends His Son Jesus to deliver us from the ultimate cause and source of our suffering, sin, death, and the devil. See, Jesus was raised up on a tree so that all who would believe in Him would be healed and have eternal life. Now, you may be wondering, if you're putting yourself in the place of God, why? I would have dropped the people of Israel way before Numbers chapter 21, but that's because I don't have immeasurable grace and unending love, and a love that is for people who have no business being loved. But isn't that what Paul tells us in our epistle reading today? That when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, dead people don't do anything. They don't love, they don't ask, they don't see, they don't know. And yet God in His immeasurable mercy raises those people to life in love, a love beyond all measuring, a love that requires the death of His sinless, perfect, only begotten Son, Jesus, raised on the tree of the cross, so that all those like you and me who believe in Him may have eternal life. Dear friends in Christ, those times when your prayers seem to go unanswered, or are not answered in the way that you would like, remember John 3.16. It's a verse that comes easily to mind for most of us, but it speaks to a deep truth that God loves you and has saved you from all your sin so that the sufferings you bear in this life are put in the context of salvation and a life unbroken that cannot be snuffed out. That's why when we gather together in mourning for the loss of a loved one and earthly death, It isn't a time of despair and lament only, but also a time of hope in the promises of the resurrection of Jesus. For even though we didn't know what to pray for, He came to fix everything, including the real problems we can't see. And so we trust in Him. As I was preparing for the sermon, one story came to my mind. I can't remember what year it was. It was near the beginning of my time as a pastor that shooting at the church in Texas. And there was a lot of mocking and scorn going on in our culture for the Christians who were praying and worshiping God because a lot of people said, what good did it do them? They still got killed in church. And I read an article by a Lutheran pastor that put that in perspective, that God was answering their prayer. He was answering their prayer from deliverance from sin, death, and the grave, because now that Christ has gone before us in the grave, He has sanctified it as the gateway to a new life, an eternal life in Christ. And so our Lord does answer our prayers, just not always the way we would like, but it's always better than we can imagine. 
turns out Jesus is the most confusing and wonderful answer to the prayer that we never prayed. In the name of Jesus, amen.